Derek Prince Ministries, proclaiming the inspired Word of God around the world. Derek Prince is an internationally recognized Bible teacher and author. Through books, audios, videos, and radio broadcasts, Derek seeks to reach the unreached and teach the untaught. In over 50 years of ministry, Derek has reached over 100 nations in more than 50 languages. And now, Derek Prince. I have sworn by myself, it's the Lord speaking, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. God is going to insist at a certain point an acknowledgement of his total sovereignty from every living creature in the universe that has knees. That includes grasshoppers and all sorts of things. Every knee shall bow. And again, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, it's going to be specifically to Jesus that we're going to bow, not just to God the Father. Speaking about the exaltation of Jesus in Philippians 2 verses 9 and 10, he says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. So one day you're going to have to do it. You might as well do it voluntarily now. So that, remember, is an act of worship. And then there's another activity of the hands that we didn't deal with, which I believe could be called an act of worship. Sometimes the borderline between worship and praise is very fine. And I'm not content to come up with, I'm not trying to come up with some final definition. I think praise and worship often merge into one another. Either we go through praise into worship or we come from worship back into praise. But here's another activity which I love. Psalm 47, verse 1. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. So when we clap our hands, we're worshiping God. See? Worship is not some rigid posture that you sit in. It's an activity of the whole body. It says also, shout to God with the voice of Trump. Now a lot of Christians think that to shout means to sing loudly. It doesn't. Not at all. It means to shout. I'm glad it does because I couldn't sing to save my life. But I can shout. And I'm going to show you how to do it. I think you should stand up at this point if you don't mind. I'll give you one, <coughs> one demonstration. I'm a little hoarse today but it'll come on. Alright, now this is it. Jesus Christ is Lord! Okay? <laughs> All right. Now you feel better. You see, you changed your position. Your circulation was beginning to suffer. Now, I want you all to do it. All together, with all your lungs, so that they can hear us even down in Miami, all right? Now, I'll do it, I'll do your one, two, three, and then, okay? One, two, three. Jesus Christ is Lord! <laughs> You see how that liberates us? We're silly if we don't do it. I didn't expect a reaction like that, but I thank God for it. Now, you may sit down if you can. Now, we come to another, which is the most 
used description of worship in the whole Bible. And it is falling prostrate on your face before God. And when you do that, that has a meaning too. Because the root problem of the fallen human race is the desire to be independent of God. Started with Adam and Eve. They wanted knowledge so that they wouldn't have to depend on God. And when they got the knowledge, the first thing they discovered was they were naked. <clears throat> but that is born into every descendant of Adam. It's this innate desire to be independent of God. It's called technically the old man, the old Adam. And God has only got one remedy for the old Adam. You know what it is? He doesn't send him to church or Sunday school or teach him the golden rule or get him to join the Kiwanis. His solution is execution. But the good news is the execution took place nearly 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. Our old man was crucified with him. <clears throat> I think I've got time to relate an experience that happened to me many years ago in the 1950s when I was pastoring a very small congregation in, in the center of London and we would go out three times every week and hold an open air meeting at Speaker's Corner Marble Arch. Some of you have been there maybe, but I want to tell you it's not anything like it used to be because they've changed the, the whole layout and also in those days, people didn't have anywhere to go. There was no television. They probably didn't have money for a movie. And so we got hundreds of people there. And uh, I used to preach, as I say, three times every week. And most of our congregation was built up by people that we won to the Lord through those street meetings. Well, one night I had a dream. And in this dream, I was watching a street meeting like we have with the people standing around in a ring and a man in the middle preaching. And, but I said to myself, what he's saying is pretty good, but I don't like the way he looks. He looked kind of hunchback and he had one leg with a built up boot and there was something a little bit crooked about the whole of him. So I thought that's strange. Well, about a week later, I got precisely the same dream. So I thought to myself, God must be trying to say something to me. So I said to the Lord, now that man in the middle of the ring, what he was saying was all right, but he didn't really, he wasn't attractive to look at. Who was the man? And God answered as Nathan answered to David, thou art the man. He said, your preaching is all right, but there's things in your nature that I don't approve of. Now it was just about Easter time and as I walked around, I had this inner mental picture of three crosses on Calvary's hill. The middle cross, taller than the other two. And uh, the Holy Spirit has got a sense of humor. He said, now tell me, for whom was the middle cross made? But think before you answer. So I thought and I said, for Barabbas. And he said, that's right. But he said, Jesus took the place of Barabbas. That's the thing you don't often realize. The cross was made for somebody else. Then the Holy Spirit said to me, but I, think Je I thought Jesus took your place. So I said, yes. Then he said, you must be Barabbas. And it came with a revelation, I never argue with people. But I saw that I was the criminal for whom that cross was made. It fitted me exactly. This was my old nature, the old Adam. And then I realized God's remedy. Our old man was crucified with him. It's a historical fact. It's true whether you know it or whether you believe it. But if you know it and believe it, it can change your life. Now, how did we get there? Tell me that. Uh, I was dealing with the fact that the ultimate act of worship and the most commonly described one in the Bible is to prostrate yourself on your face before God. And this too has a meaning. It means 
total dependence on God. It means, Lord, I can do nothing without you. I can't even start. You see, every time I preach now, I did it this morning, I tell God, God, I'm totally dependent on you. If you don't give, I have nothing to give. And I always feel secure when I've said that. I don't always get down on my face, although Ruth and I were both on our faces this morning before this meeting in our bedroom. I'll tell you, I feel secure on my face. Because I can't go any lower. I think it was John Bunyan who said, He that is down need fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his God. See, when you're on the floor, you say, Lord, I've come as low as I can come. There's only one way I can go from now on. That's up. It's a, it's a secure feeling. Let's just look at a few of the people that ended up on their face before God. <clears throat> In Genesis chapter 17, The Lord appeared to Abraham twice. It's a very important chapter because the Lord made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his descendants to be their God and to give them that little strip of land at the east end of the Mediterranean as an everlasting possession. I just mentioned that, I'm not going to dwell on it. So the first time when the Lord appeared to Abraham, Abraham he still was at that time. In Genesis 17 verse 3, it says, He said, I am Almighty God, El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. And a little further on in the same chapter, verses 13 and following. We read from verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Remember, she was well past the age of bearing children. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Incredible, he said. How could the Lord say such a thing? But at the right time, it happened. But you see, Abraham was pretty used to being on his face before God. And I think if you check almost all the great men of the Bible, at some time or another, every one of them, was on his face before God. That's the way, the way to greatness. Get on your face before God. Now there's one more, one more act of worship. I mean, I'm not saying these are all, but these are the ones that I have traced. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Well, really 14. Now, David had at last succeeded in getting the ark up to Jerusalem. He'd had a lot of problems because the first time, the first crew that was assigned to do it, God killed one of them. And they had to take the ark off into a place and wait and see what they had to learn. Well, the lesson was, nobody may touch the ark but the Levites. And that's the lesson we still need to bear in mind. There are things of God which may only be touched by the people whom God has set apart to touch them. Well, eventually they got back with all sorts of music. And there was the ark installed in Jerusalem. And it says in verse 14, Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod, which is an, over, uh, an item of clothing you put on over, which makes you, in a sense, a priest. So David danced before the Lord with all his might. Now David was a mighty man of valor. 
So when he danced with all his might, I don't think there was any muscle in his body that wasn't moving. And it's clear from the description that he was leaping up and down. What's that? Worship. See, you're not really liberated till your whole body is liberated. Now I've got to the stage in life where my legs don't do always what I want them to do. But I learned this secret many years ago, about 1965, 66. I was in a church in Chicago and there was an English preacher who's now with the Lord, a dear brother of mine, named Harry Greenwood. And Harry had a tambourine and a voice and he danced. Some of you may have been in meetings that he held. And I sat there more or less in the front row and I looked at him and I thought, I wonder if that's right. But he went on dancing, he didn't ask my permission. <laughs> After a while I said to myself, well if he can do it, I can do it. So when I got up on the platform, I started to dance. And when I started, I lost count of time. I mean, I went on so long that somebody went away to their apartment, got a camera, came back and photographed me. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I was liberated. And I've been an instrument of God to liberate many. I was in a big meeting at the Tennessee, Georgia CFO camp in Tokoa, Georgia. And uh, I was up there on the platform. I'd finished my message. I didn't know what to do next. And I've been a, a real fan of the ballet. I mean, there was a time in my life many years ago when I would be in the front row and know all the movements and everything. And I thought, I'm going to dance. So it was a large platform. I danced all the way around the platform, came back to the pulpit. Well, the Spirit of God just moved into that meeting. Everybody was liberated, see? Not because of me, but because that's one of God's ways of liberating His people. Now, there's another side to this story. If you look down at the end of chapter 6 of 2 second, second Samuel, I should have said, not Second Chronicles. I'm sorry if I got you to the wrong place. Anyhow, then David, in verse 20, David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, It was before the Lord, who chose me instead of your father and all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and I will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be had in honor. And the last verse is sad. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death, because she despised her husband for dancing before the Lord. That's sad, isn't it? But it's very, very dangerous with your natural, critical, carnal mind to criticize people that are enjoying the Lord. They may be inexpert, they may be not highly educated, but God likes it. He wants to be enjoyed. So be careful. So, let's move on. Now, I know you're thinking, well, why the body? What's the importance of the body? Jesus said, we must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, the second scripture we proclaimed was, may our whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. So total personality is spirit, soul, and body. And you have to understand the interaction between them. And it's brought out in one very familiar verse, Psalm 103, verse 1, where David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, what was talking to David's soul? His soul wasn't talking to itself. What was saying to the soul, the soul Bless the Lord? David's spirit, you see? David's spirit was on fire. David was in contact with the Lord. And bear in mind, it's the spirit that makes direct contact with the Lord, not the soul, not the body. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, not one soul, nor one body. Your spirit is the, the highest part of you that can be God conscious and can be united with God. Now your spirit, being stirred up by the Spirit of God, says we've got to do something about this. So, don't just sit there, do something, get excited, bless the Lord. And the soul, which is the, what you'd call the gear lever of the, of the, of the personality, the soul is what makes decisions, you see? So the soul says, all right, I decide, I'll get my lips, my organs of speech doing it. So that's the, the route that's followed. The spirit deals with the soul and the soul deals with the body. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says there'll be a difference between our present body and our resurrection body. If you want to turn there, I don't even know what to... I thought verse 44, he says, our present body, the, the English translation says natural, but that doesn't by any means express the meaning. It's a soulish body. Our body in eternity will be a spiritual body. So what's the difference between a soulish body and a spiritual body? Well, a soulish body has to have the soul to set it in motion. See, the spirit can't operate the body direct. It has to go through the soul. Now, I don't know how this will work out, but in heaven, in eternity, we'll have a spiritual body. The soul won't have to go through, the spirit won't have to go through the soul. The spirit will just say, let's praise the Lord, and that will be it. Let's dance. Do you believe they dance in heaven? I certainly do. So, what I'm saying is, to get your whole personality in tune with God and responding to God as God desires. Your spirit has to work through your soul to move your body. That's the way it comes. And so, when your spirit wants to worship God, there's not much it can do without the cooperation of the soul and the body. And a spirit that cannot worship God because the soul and the body do not cooperate is an imprisoned spirit. The body for that spirit is a prison, shut up, unable to respond. And you see, that's the problem with millions of Christians, especially Christians that have got their Christianity from what we call the West, whatever that may be. We have given people a picture of Christianity, and thank God we gave people the Word, we gave them the Bible, but we gave them a very incomplete picture of church of worship and now when people do the real thing they feel strange because we've conditioned people to expect the abnormal what happens now it's slightly different in this congregation I'm going to say but basically when most people go into church their physical movements are very limited they walk in sit down stand up sit down, stand up, and walk out. Isn't that right? I mean, I went that way for years. That is not what God wants. We are frustrating God if we conduct ourselves like that. God wants worship, the way I've described it, from the head to the toes, and everything in between. Now, I just want to take one further pattern. I want to speak about three things that are very closely related. Thanksgiving, praise, and worship. All of them are good, but they're none of them a substitute for the other. By thanksgiving, and this is a generality, we acknowledge good, God's goodness, his kindness. By praise, we acknowledge God's greatness. But by worship, we acknowledge what? The one indefinable quality of God, which is holiness. That's right. This is where it's at, you see. Without true worship, there's very little that relates to God's holiness. See, God's holiness is unique. 
God has many, many other wonderful characteristics. He's wise, he's strong, he's just, he's clever. But we can see all those to some very fragmented extent in people around about us. But holiness we can see only in one person, in God. This is the unique revelation of God. We'll come to it a little further. So let's consider the relationship between thanksgiving, praise, and worship. And we'll turn to Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Now that describes the appointed way of access to God. <coughs> and it's never varied. If you want to get in through his gates, it's with thanksgiving. If you want to pass through his courts, it's with praise. And God has never changed that. You can pray without all that, but you're at a distance. You're like the ten lepers who stood at a distance and cried out to Jesus for mercy. And he had mercy, he heard that cry. But they have never really had access to God. I make it a general principle, and I only make an exception if there's some immediate crisis. I never pray without starting to thank God and then to praise Him. And after that, I know I'm in contact with Him. So that's the way into God's presence. Now what do you do when you get into God's presence? Psalm 95 tells us. Now we're going to read the first seven verses, but not all at once. <clears throat> oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. We won't go through that again, but note, it says shout, not sing loud. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. <coughs> For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. So how do we get into the presence of the Lord? With thanksgiving, with praise, exuberant praise, shouting joyfully. That brings us into the presence of God. Now why do we praise him? Because of his greatness. He is the great creator. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. We are relating to him as the great creator of all. But that is not the end of the journey. 